Welcome to Ossington Pentecostal Church. We are so happy you could join us online today. Our service is just about to start, but before it does, let me share with you some of our announcements. Sunday at 11 a.m., we have our online worship service. Wednesdays at 7 p.m., we have our online life group. Thursdays at 7.30 p.m. is our online prayer room. Fridays, our youth have an online service at 7.30 p.m. Our amazing group of volunteers have created Kids Corner, a segment dedicated just to the kids of OPC. As well, they've developed a Google Classroom where kids can log on and get great materials and activities for the service. If you would like more information or to register for the Google Classroom, please email opckidscorner at gmail.com. February 10th, our Wednesday Night Life group will be starting a new series called End Times, a study of prophecy. This study will go deeper into the scriptures through video teaching and discussion. Join us Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. to go deeper together. Please visit our website daily for more news and updates and to connect to our services. You can also find the latest video sermon from our pastor. Our website is also a place where you can give your tithes and offerings. Go to giving and from there it'll give you instructions on how you can give a bank e-transfer, give your tithe by credit card, or by mail. That's all the announcements for today. We want to remind everyone to please keep your mics muted and your cameras off until the end of the service. This will help us out tremendously in ensuring a smooth flow during our online service. Thank you for all your cooperation. Now, let's turn it over to Pastor David. Praise the Lord. What a beautiful day the Lord has given us with the beautiful sunshine outside, nice white fresh covering of snow to make everything look perfectly clean. And I trust that you're really blessed of God today. And it's a great day for us to come together and rejoice in his name. I look forward to worshiping with you today, to celebrating the goodness of God and the love of God. I trust that you're all celebrating together God's presence as we gather for this gathering in worship of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to pray and ask God's blessing on us today, and then we're going to go listen to our Kids Corner this morning. I believe that the Kids Corner this morning is Josh De Silva who has prepared for us today. And so we're going to look forward to that. But let's just ask God's blessing on us today, shall we, as we open and begin this time together in our service. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the precious name of Jesus Christ, the greatest gift of love, your Son, our Lord and Savior. We ask today, God, that each each person that's listening to this program, each one that's joined us together, will hear from the Holy Spirit today, whether it's through the Kids' Corner ministry, whether it's through worship and song, whether it's through a prayer that's offered up or the preaching of the Word. Let everything that is done be used by you, O God, to bless, to edify, and to strengthen your people, and to touch our hearts and draw us ever closer to you. Now, Lord, we commit this service. We ask that you be with those that are working in the background, in the technical side of things, and just help us, O God, to lift up the mighty name of Jesus and give him glory today. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. Now we're going to listen to Josh as he teaches from the word of God to all of us today. God bless you, Josh. Hi kids, I got another awesome lesson for you guys today. I have these glasses here and I'm going to use them to show you how God and his Holy Spirit help us see and recognize things when we can't see with our physical eyes and how he helps us see more clearly. Ephesians 1 verse 18 to 19 says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. 
So kids, what do you think Paul means when he says the eyes of your heart? Do you think he means your normal eyes? The eyes that you use to see what's in front of you? Well, the eyes of our heart do not help us see the physical world around us, but they do help us know and understand in our hearts about the things of God and His kingdom. 2 Corinthians 3 verses 15 to 16 says, Even to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. This verse talks about a veil. But what is a veil? A veil is something that keeps us from seeing like this. You see, when we accept Jesus as our Savior and Lord, He comes into our life and He uncovers our eyes and helps us to see God and spiritual things. We can see hope in Him. We can see riches that are not money, but peace and joy and love. We can see His power at work. Every day, we have a choice to allow the Holy Spirit to help us see, like putting on our glasses or not. When we sit down to read the Bible, we need to ask the Holy Spirit to help us understand what we are reading or to put on our glasses. When we don't know what decision to make, we need to ask the Holy Spirit to help us know what God wants or to put on our glasses. And when we are angry at a friend that hurt us, we need to ask the Holy Spirit to help us forgive them by putting on our glasses. Well, that's the end of the lesson today, kids. I hope you enjoyed it, and I can't wait to see you next week. But before we go, just let me pray for you quickly. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here to learn about your word and how we, by your Holy Spirit's power, can see what you are trying to teach us and what you want us to do. Help us put on our glasses and allow the Holy Spirit to show us your will and the way, the path we are to take in every situation as we go throughout this week, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. See you next time. Well, praise God. Thank you, Josh, for that wonderful lesson. And, it, and it's the work of the Spirit as he opened our eyes to see God and to understand with our spirit. And we, we pray that each and every one of us seek that from Lord every day of our lives as he continues to lead us into deeper understanding of who he is. I just want to read a passage from the scriptures this morning, just a verse, actually, before we go into worship. It's found in Psalm 146. It says this, it says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. I press, pray that you, you have determined that every day of your life, no matter what happens, you're going to make it a day where you praise God. You'll find some way whether it's through nature, whether it's through listening to a song or singing a song, or whether it's expressing thanks to God or giving him praise verbally or expressing it to somebody else, how good God is, that you will praise the Lord. And now this morning, I want to encourage you. Pastor Kara has prepared a time of worship for us. And as we go into worship, I encourage you, lift up your voice at home and sing the songs as a praise unto God. Let those in your household hear you praising the Lord this morning with your voice and give glory to his name. The Lord bless you as you do. Sing through the dead will 
restoring my portion, deliverer, my shelter, strong tower, my very present help in time of need. Whom have I in heaven but you? There's none I desire beside. God is a very present help in our time of need. His word assures us of that this this morning, and we want to come to our Lord today on behalf of all the needs of those present and those who we know and love. As we prepare our hearts to go before the Lord in prayer this morning, I want us to continue to lift up prayer for those who perhaps can't get out. They live in isolation, and they are feeling discouraged perhaps this morning. We want to lift them up in our prayers today that the Lord would give them grace. Those who are dealing with forms of depression and discouragement, let's ask the Lord to be a very present help in their time of need today. We also want to continue to pray for the Manicone family who have uh, suffered a second loss in as many weeks with the passing of Enzo Manicone. So let's remember them in our prayers that the Lord will be a, a strong sense of comfort, a strong sense of help in their time of need. And also our sister Lorraine has asked that we would remember her in prayer. She goes for other tests this week and that the Lord would be with her and that they could resolve what is her need in the Lord today. Now, how many of you here present what with us in the service today have a need? I would encourage you to just raise your hand, click that button that raises a hand. Our sister Jamie's gonna come in just a moment and she's gonna lead us in prayer. And as you raise your hand, you're saying, I'm trusting God for a need this morning. Yes. Amen. Amen. I want to read just two verses of scripture before Jamie, three verses of scripture before Jamie comes to lead us in prayer. It's found in Hebrews chapter four, verses 14 to 16. And it says this, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Let's stay strong in our confession in Jesus Christ. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Yes, Jesus understands our weaknesses in the flesh. He knows us and he knows what we're tempted with. But he was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. 
So let us, therefore, come boldly to the throne of grace. Oh, that's what we need today. We need grace upon grace from Jesus so that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. As Jamie leads us now in prayer, let's go boldly into the throne room of God's amazing grace as he is prepared to meet and minister to each one in our times of need. God bless you, Sister Jamie. Heavenly Father, we bless your name this morning. Thank you so much, Lord, for this day that you've given us, for being in our lives, Lord. We need you every hour. And thank you for meeting our needs, for your protection, for the eternal life that we have now and that we can look forward to, Lord. Father, we ask for forgiveness from our sins. We turn away from them and look towards our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving us, for cleansing our hearts. This is the greatest gift we could ever imagine. Lord, I lift up to you those who are grieving. Please provide peace and comfort for them, especially for the Manikone family and those around them, their loved ones. I thank you for the example of Brother Frank Manikone. Thank you for his life, Lord God, and how he glorified you with it. I pray for those surrounding Enzo Manikoni, Lord, that they would also sense your presence, Father. Lord, be with them, Lord. Holy Spirit, surround them. I pray, Lord, for the healing of any physical ailments amongst our brothers and sisters. Lord, you are a mighty and powerful God, and you are able to heal. I lift up to you our sister Lorraine. I ask for an intervention in her life and her body, Lord. I pray that you would give her a sense of comfort this morning, that peace would overwhelm her, Lord. Bless her, Lord, and use her as a light wherever she goes. For anyone who is experiencing depression or isolation this morning, Father, lift them up. Holy Spirit, encourage them. That is your job, Lord, and We thank you so much that we can count on you when we feel hopeless, when we feel lonely. We bless your name because you are such a good God. For anyone who's raised their hand today for a prayer request, or even if they haven't, Lord, and I know that you're thinking of them, Lord. You know their needs and you are able to meet them. I pray for the healing of emotional wounds, Lord, that you would reach deep, Lord, into those lives that that are needing a touch through the power of Christ. Help us to put our trust in you, Lord. Prepare our hearts to receive your word this morning. I ask that you would give us courage to share our faith with those around us. Help us to be sensitive to the opportunities that you give us. I ask, Lord, that you would prepare hearts to receive the gospel, and use our new building to do that, Lord. Thank you for the work that's being done there. I ask that it would continue and that you would make it come to fruition, Lord. We trust that this will bring glory to you. Help us to love one another, Lord. I ask for the protection of your saints around the world. We need you, Lord. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Let us grow in grace. And please speak to us through your word today. Give us wisdom and understanding. Be with us when we study the end times this week. Give us wisdom again as we grapple with those passages, Lord. Please show us what you want us to learn, Lord. Even though we are apart, we stand united in your love. And we bless your name. We worship you, Lord. We thank you, and we love you. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jamie, for leading us in prayer. And we know that God answers prayer. And we look forward to hearing the testimonies, as we've done many times, over and over, how God intervenes and God hears and answers prayer. And so if God is at work in your life and he does a work, 
be sure to share it with somebody. Let people know what God is doing. And in that way, you can praise the Lord and give him glory. But we want to prepare our hearts this morning for the word of God. The scripture tells us that God has placed gifts in the body of Christ, and he's called some into special ministries. And so this morning, we have somebody who has been gifted of God and has been called of God. And I've asked Pastor Kara this morning if she would come and minister the word of God. So I invite you to open your heart and hear what the Holy Spirit has to say to all of us today from his word. God bless you, Pastor Kara, as you come. Thank you, Pastor. It's so, one. what an introduction, first of all. Wow, thank you very much. <laughs> That's so nice to hear. And uh, thank you so much for asking me to come and speak this morning. Good morning, everyone. It's so great to be here with you. I am always so happy to just worship with you guys and to fellowship. Even though the context of our fellowship looks a little different, I look forward to seeing you all and to participating in worshiping and serving the Lord together as a family every Sunday. I look forward to that. So I am so happy to be here with you, even though it's different than what we're, we're used to. Although it's been about a year now, I feel like we might be getting used to this, but I just want to let you know, I'm so happy that you're here. I'm happy to be here with you. And I'm so excited just to give this word that I feel that God has really laid upon my heart. Um, I just want to open up with a word of prayer, and then we're going to get right into it. Father God, thank you for today. You, this is the day that you have made, and we will. We make a choice to rejoice and be glad in it. And God, we come together today because we are surrounded by your truth. We are surrounded, uh, we, we surround ourselves around your love and your great, great uh, sacrifice and your incredible grace. God, I pray today that the word that you have given to us, even though it was written many years ago, that, ago, that it would still take such a deep root in our hearts this morning and that we would not just be readers or hearers, but we would actually be doers of your word. We ask this all in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, this is an interesting weekend, isn't it? Today is Valentine's Day, and it's a day that is recognized in our culture as a day to show someone special in your life that you love them. You can see the symbols of it everywhere, the hearts, the cupids, and the cultural symbols of amour and love. Also, it's family day tomorrow. Yet another wonderful celebration. It's a holiday where we're, we're, we're supposed to think and spend time with our families. We're supposed to see how valuable that is and to put them first and to just take a break from work and focus on our families. In fact, we've also included this week with our email announcements, we included a parent's planner which is something that you can do as a family. It gives scripture verses. It gives you challenges to do as a family every day for 2021. So if you can't open it or something happened, just send me a quick message and uh, I will send it to you. But parents, that is there for you, that you can have this throughout the year just to have some activities and the word of God enrich your family. So even though this is a newer holiday that we now uh, celebrate together, it's still a really great time where we can focus on spending time with one another as a family. Although I think for some families, because of the pandemic, you may want to spend just a little less time with your family. It's not something you're used to altogether in that space for so long, but still, it's a great time to just focus on spending time with one another. But you know what? After the weekend has passed and the flowers and the candy go on sale and we get back to work, finally reality sets in. And what happens to these relationships? And not just these relationships, what about the rest of the relationships in our lives? Just because there isn't a special day for it. I'm thinking about a relationship here. As a church, there is no special holiday to highlight, you know, church congregation day. There is nothing for that, but yet it's still something that should be celebrated. And not just for one day, but it becomes a lifestyle for us. But how do we give special emphasis to these relationships every day in our lives? Not only that, how do we maintain that 
throughout the entire year. It's very difficult sometimes to have relationships with other people to show love. You know, thinking about this, I went through the scriptures and you know what? The Bible has a lot to say about love, but there is a passage that I thought it really just quotes love over and over and over again. It's a record amount of times and it exposes love for what it is, not just a feeling, not just a day or a weekend, but the will and presence of God himself. So with that, I'm going to invite all of you to turn to the book of First John, and we're going to be reading from chapter 4, starting at verse 7. If you don't have a Bible, which I really hope you get one, <laughs> the words will be up on the screen for you. It says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifest towards us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he gave us he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and test and testify that the father has sent the son as savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the one of the love that God has for us. God is love And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar for he does not love his brother whom he has seen. How can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him that he who loves God must love his brother also. Love, written about in so many ways. Songs speak of its greatness, its beauty, its sorrow, and its pain. Brilliant authors have penned amazing stories and and moving subject matter around it. And even though we have but one word to sum it up, many languages have multiple words for its multiple meanings. One of those is actually Greek. We could spend several studies just on the word love and the different words that the Greek language uses for it in the Bible. John's authorship of this letter, though, in its contents is a far cry from the sonnets sonnets of Shakespeare or any pop lyric, but in it is so much incredible truth and the foundation of what love is. Here outlines exactly what the love is in its purest, most beautiful form, God. You know, John's writing to a group of, of Christians. It's not specified which ones, but he is writing to a group of Christians that are battling um, with this false doctrine that has come in 
to the church Gnosticism, which that in itself, that belief system, that false doctrine attacks the very nature of who Jesus is and what we know to be salvation. In this, this letter that John sends to them, he simply puts what it is to be a Christian, to be one who knows and recognizes who Jesus is, what he has done for us, and then how we are supposed to live. Christ loves us, and we are to show love to each other. So simply put, but yet so difficult, it seems, to live by and to put into practice. Yet love these days seems as common, too, as the name Jesus or God himself. We use it so easily, so frivolously, and and that's so difficult for us to, to see in this world, that the word love that has been associated with the purest form of what it is, which is God's love for us, is now misused just as often as his name is. You know, we did a study actually about the the foundations of of life and the Ten Commandments, and the pastor did a great message on what it meant to misuse the Lord's name. And I think that has a very practical effect and, and value to even what we say when we say we love people. Because oftentimes we do a disservice to that love that God has commanded us and that God has stood the example of. So how do we fix this? How do we bring our love for one another to be just like the words that John describes here in this letter to some Christians? You know, someone once wrote this, without a solid foundation, you'll have trouble creating anything of value. What we need is to look at our relationships and the foundation that they are built upon and look at and apply it to what John is speaking about, that we would love the way that is described here, that we would love with the love of Christ and where that foundation is built is in Christ himself. Let's look at our families, for example. You know, today is Valentine's Day. So a lot of uh, husbands might be out there and have been doing something very nice for their wives and wives, you may have done something very nice for your husbands. And I know maybe some, some moms and dads have done some special things for their children. And that's wonderful. It's great to celebrate the love that you have for each other. And it's so great to see that there's an expression of love like that. But I think a wise person once said, and I I think our pastor has mentioned it, and it's been mentioned by many others, it's every day should be like Valentine's Day. You should treat each other with such love and, and want to do such nice things for each other all of the time. You know, there are actually scripture verses that talk about the family unit. They talk about how we are supposed to love one another. In fact, Paul highlights it when he talks about how wives are supposed to submit and honor their husbands and how husbands are supposed to love their wives like Christ loves the church. That's right. The structure of the family now being like how Christ loves the church, that example that is supposed to be set. It's not one of just... uh, emotions and it's not one of just feelings and it's not one that's just celebrated once a year. No, it's brought about by a very sacrificial love. And like Paul says, it's supposed to be comparative to the way that Christ loves his church and leads his church. You know, the Bible also speaks of how we're supposed to honor our parents. We're supposed to honor them. And, and, be, and this was perfectly displayed by Christ himself when he humbled himself and gave honor and glory to God the Father. He gave the example of love that we are supposed to have in our families. Love, honor, submission, and respect. You may think, well, 
what is there? What, what example can I use to understand what we're supposed to love like in a family? Look at Christ himself. Christ himself gives us the example of how we're supposed to love our family members. You know, sometimes it's hard, harder to put that into practice, though, because the closer someone is to you, the harder it is when they hurt you and you feel betrayed by them. And Jesus felt very similar things to you. People who, we, who said that they loved him, who were close to him, betrayed him. And yet he still walked to the cross. In fact, he, he told people, he said from the cross, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they do. You know, um, I was reading a book, uh, what we were doing in Young Adults, and it was called Crazy Love. It's by Francis Chan. What a great book talking about God's love for us and then our love for other people. And I remember reading that book and being so convicted by God. You see, I've had a family member hurt me in the past. And although I felt like I had forgiven them, it was still difficult for me to show love towards them because it hurt. They were close to me and it hurt. But I heard God so clearly when I was reading that book. He said, you know, you feel love and compassion for strangers on the street, but you don't have that same love for the family member, that family member that hurts you. And I felt so clearly that day that love isn't just about people who treat you well. And it's not just about loving the stranger on the street and having compassion for them in Jesus name. It's also about loving your family that way. A love that is so strong that even if they have hurt you, you're still supposed to love them the way that Christ loved you and commands you to love one another. It's hard. It's difficult. But whenever I think about how people can hurt me and my family and, and, and it aches me down to my heart and I don't want to discredit any type of hurt and pain that you may be feeling, but I can tell you something, there's so much freedom in just forgiving and loving them with the love of Christ. Getting back to the fact that I hurt God every single time I sinned. That even before Christ loved me, that's what John wrote about. You know, before ever, before everything, Christ loved us and sacrificed for us. Christ didn't ask for an apology. Christ didn't ask for, for us to be perfect. No, he said, I'm going to love you. And through that love, it will, it will be perfected. Oh man, getting a hold of that truth in my life. I cannot tell you how much joy I felt in that moment. You'd think that you'd feel pain, but no, there was just so much joy. And I bring that now to every time I feel difficulty, when family drama comes up, when hurt words are said, I come back to the fact that I'm supposed to love my family members, the closest in my life, the way that Christ loves me. How are you loving your family members today? It's Valentine's Day and it's a great day to express and go over and above sometimes. But every single day, How is this love pouring out from you to your family? Is it like the love that Christ has given you? The next relationship that I want to talk about and that is really centered upon this entire scripture verse is our love for each other as Christians. The love the church should have for each other is truly unique. In fact, although the principles of this apply to every relationship in our lives, this is specifically the relationship that John is addressing. It's the relationship that we are supposed to have as the body of Christ. 1 John 3.11 says this, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning that we should love one another. John is actually drawing back from what he said in the gospel of John, which is what Jesus said to the disciples. In John 13, 34 to 35, he said, Jesus says, a new command I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. 
by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Again, here we see the same thing applied. We're supposed to love each other, not as what we feel like love is or what the world shows us that love is. We are supposed to love one another, Jesus says, as I have loved you. In other words, we're supposed to love each other as Christ has loved us. Jesus himself is our greatest testimony to the world. Jesus himself said that the greatest testimony that we have to the world around us is our love for one another. You know, reading this passage and going back to it and reading this whole chapter on love, I started thinking to myself, you know, we put a lot of time, effort, planning, funds into ministries, outreach, evangelism, and I encourage all of those things. Those are absolutely wonderful. We actually, I think we need more of this, more people to participate. We need more emphasis on our, on our outreach to the world around us. But I want to say something to you, church. If we put all of this time and effort into building these ministries, but we don't love each other, we failed. We have failed. I often think what it would feel like for God to see us operate like that. You know, think back to your dating days. For those of you who that may be a while to think back, and some of you are living that right now, think back to it. Think about loving someone so much and pursuing them and pursuing them. And then finally, after you've pursued them for so long, they agree to to go out with you. Man, that's exciting. And things seem to be going really well. And it comes to that time where you're bringing them to meet your family. That's always a bit of a nerve wracking thing. When you bring somebody that you care about deeply, that you've spent so much time and effort pursuing to see your family. And what if you brought them to a family gathering and all of the family were fighting with one another? gossiping about each other, acting one way in public, how they're this perfect picture of a family, but yet behind closed doors, all they do is bicker and fight and don't seem to have any type of love for each other at all. How embarrassed would you be to see the one that you love so much and want to bring into this family witness such a thing? And I often wonder to myself if God feels that way sometimes where we pursue and we, where he, he says, like, I stand at the door knocking. He loves people. He wants to bring them to him. And then he brings them into the body of Christ, the family. And what they see is not at all what they thought they would see. They see fighting and disagreements and bitterness and unforgiveness and people who are one way in public and then another way. Think of how embarrassed That would make you feel if you brought someone into your family like that and how it must grieve the heart of God if we were to act the same way. Again, we could argue that they may have caused us offense, that they should come make it right. But consider the example that Paul gives us in Romans where he says, Even when we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And even John takes this command about our love for one another so seriously that he says this in 1 John 1, uh, sorry, 1 John 3, 14 to 15, he says this, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that murderers, that uh, that murderer has, sorry, brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Whew. Those are some heavy words. Let that sink in for a second. He who hates his brother is a murderer. 
it's not enough just to say that you're not loving. No, the context of your mind that you think when you think of murder is the same as when you say, I hate my brother or my sister in Christ. And the heavy penalty and consequences that come with that kind of hate within God's family. You aren't just a bitter person. You aren't just an angry person. John compares you to a murderer and all that comes with that. Remember that even when we didn't deserve it, God still demonstrated his own love for us. That we were, when we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't apologize. We didn't come and say, I'm sorry before. And then Jesus went to the cross. He did it for us because he loved us. And with that realization, with that knowledge of who Jesus is and what he's done for us, getting that deep inside, John is saying there should be no hate between us. Coming to the realization of what Christ has done. We shouldn't hate each other. We should love each other. And this is how the world is going to know that we are the disciples of Jesus Christ. And it doesn't stop there. There is an entire world out there. There is people out there that we may not have even met yet or that we pass by every single day. And God loves them. The same love that he has shown us through his incredible sacrifice is the same love he shows them. And by that, we are supposed to love them. It's John again who wrote the words of Jesus in his gospel that said, For God so loved the world that he sent his only son. For God so loved the world. Wow. And if we understand Christ's love, then we understand we're supposed to have a love for the world. Grasping that the strangers that we can see on the street, the people we pass by every single day, are people that we are supposed to demonstrate love towards. You know, Jesus himself gave gave this perfectly when he talked about the commandments He says this in Matthew 22, 37 to 40. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the great commandment. And the second is like it. Who shall shall love your neighbor as yourself? And these two commandments hang all the law On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Love God first. Understand this. Understand that God, loving God and getting that love inside of you and then taking that and loving your neighbor. Wow. That is what everything is hung upon. All the commandments and the laws of the prophets are on these two things. Love God and love your neighbor. John even goes a little bit further in um, 1 John 3, 16 to 19. He says, uh, but this, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, do not let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. John brings it a step further just to say, don't let it just be your words. Let it be your actions. If you see someone in need, then you are supposed to go and help them if you have the means to do so. It's not just enough to say that we love one another. We're supposed to act it out at the exact same time. We're supposed to see if we see a brother or a sister in need. We're supposed to reach out and help them. 
This is what love looks like. Love is not just what the Hollywood version is, but it's everyday actions. When Jesus said he loved us, there was no limit to what he did for us. One of my favorite songs is a song called uh, Love Song by a band called Third Day. And it's all about what Jesus did for us, how much he loved us, that there is no mountain he wouldn't climb, that there's no uh, water he wouldn't walk across just to be with us. He did anything and everything. And we are to act in the world, to the world around us and to the relationships around us in a very similar, not a very, sorry, in that similar fact, fashion. We are supposed to move beyond words and put everything into action so that we wouldn't just be people who look like we've got it all together on the outside, look like we're loving on the outside, but really love people with everything we are, just like Christ gave everything that we would love with everything. You know, I went to Chicago a couple of years back, beautiful city. I loved going and visiting Chicago and Chicago is known for a couple of things. It's known for its sports teams. It's deep dish pizza, but it's also known to be a place of many skyscrapers. If you walk in downtown Chicago, you will just see tall buildings all over the place. And I really enjoyed actually going and seeing, going to the top of some of these buildings and seeing what it's like. And many of you have probably been to the CN Tower and see how high up it is and, and seen what it's like. But you know, these skyscrapers are so huge. You would have to wonder how they aren't so affected by the elements, especially wind. The bigger the tower is, the higher it goes up, the more wind that it has to face. So I did a little bit of research and I am not an engineer by any means, but I just looked up, you know, how do skyscrapers deal with all of this wind? You know, on a normal day, the winds can get pretty high the higher you go. But what happens during a windstorm? What happens when some storm clouds start to, to form? What happens when things get tough and it's not easy to stand tall anymore? And I did a little bit of research. And again, I'm not an engineer, but when, an answer that I found was actually really interesting. It says that there's a cluster of steel columns and beams in a skyscraper's core. And it's like engineers kind of create like a stiff backbone for it that goes all the way through it. And it's designed to withstand tremendous wind forces. So the inner core, and, and it's often used sometimes as the elevator shaft, is designed um, with to go through the entire building so that it, it stays strong and sturdy to resist all of the wind. You know, just like building a skyscraper that is meant to withhold up against lots of different weather conditions. We can build beautiful, strong relationships in our lives that will not be toppled over by storms, by disagreements, by hurts, by pains, by life. See, if we build our relationships with Jesus Christ and his love at the core of every relationship, then those relationships can withstand anything that the world has to throw against it. You see, it's not enough for us to just build this beautiful image of what a relationship should look like, that we wouldn't just look like a beautiful image on the outside, but be hollowed and weak on the inside in our love. No, God wants us to build our relationships with Jesus at the core with understanding his love for you and then showing that as a beautiful expression to all of the relationships around you. An empty building would topple over at the first sign of storm clouds, but one that's got the core of Jesus's love running through it, then that's one that will not topple over. Paul writes this in Ephesians 5, 1 
to two. He says, therefore, be imitators of God's, of God, dear children. Walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us as an offering and in sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. Be imitators of Christ. Just as he loved, walk in that love. So here's my question for you. This week in our our culture has emphasized relationships. But when Tuesday comes, or the next three months, or the next six months, when all the candies and flowers have expired, and when storm clouds start to roll in, what will be at the root and the core of your relationships? Even though things may come, Christ will still remain. Even though these expressions that are all around us in culture may fade away in time, Christ will remain. Do you love your family? Maybe as I was talking about the family unit and the love that we're supposed to have for each other, there was someone that automatically came to your mind and you felt this is, this is somebody that I do not love the way that I should. Maybe it's just a facade, but it's empty and shallow. There's no core to it. Do you love your church? Do you care about every single person and show them love? Or is it just a facade to come week after week? Is there a nice shiny outside, but nothing on the inside? Do you love your neighbor? Do you love the community that God has placed you in? Whether it be your workplace, your coworkers, or even the person that is right next door to you, the people that are on your commute day in and day out, do you love them? Do you love them just the same way that God loved the world so much that he sent Jesus? Do you love your community that's around you? Or do you find it difficult to love them and to not complain about them or judge them? Are you struggling to love anyone? That's my question for you today. If the answer is yes, take it seriously and go back to the words that John wrote. Come back to where it first started, which is with Christ loving us first, even though we didn't deserve it. Build your foundation, your core of every relationship around that. It'll transform the way that you love. It'll transform the way that you forgive. It'll transform the peace and the joy around you in your life. And in areas that you thought that you could never love or that it was too difficult, it becomes so much easier because you're not just trying to love on your own understanding. You are loving with Christ's love. Is there a core in your skyscraper? Is it shallow or is it Christ at the center of it all? I want to challenge you with this word today. Get back and understand Christ's love. This can only come from spending time with him and getting in his word. And then every single day, putting that out into practice. We're going to close with a closing song today called Every Day. And it's just about getting back to understanding who God is and then taking that and being a light into the world. And that's my challenge, not just this weekend to show love, but every single day, show the love of Christ in every relationship around you. Let's just let this this closing song minister to our hearts and challenge us today.
Yes, every day we want to live for Jesus, and every day we want the love of Jesus to be seen in our life, the way we live with everyone, those in the body of Christ and everyone around us. We need to show the love of God. Thank you, Pastor Care. What a wonderful word today to remind us that we love because he first loved us, and because he loved us, we can now love others with the love of Jesus. Let's pray together, shall we? Gracious Father, I thank you this morning for this word. It's a sure word. It came from your holy word, O God, and it is the will of God through Christ Jesus for each of us to show your love to this world and to one another. In fact, Jesus said, by this will all men know you are my disciples if you have love one for another. So Father, may each one of us take this challenge to heart today. May we allow the love of Jesus to shine through us. I pray, O God, that you would bless each household, each family, each individual, O God. Let the love of Jesus be seen and manifest in all of us, and may it abound to all those who are around us. Help us to honor and glorify you. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. God bless you, family. We look forward to being together with you, all of us, one day as we come together to worship in our new church when it's renovated its completion and the uh, government allows us to all to get back together. But right now, this is what we have and we're enjoying it, everything that God is doing in our lives.